Gilgamesh was the son of Nisuna, goddess of cows, the great queen and priestess of Shamash god of the sun, and his father was Lila a famous priest of Kulub. Gilgamesh was the ruler of a Sumerian city called Uruk. This city would have been consolidated as one of the most powerful cities of the time. It is believed that Gilgamesh was the fifth king of the city. Gilgamesh was of divine origin since he possessed two parts of God and one part of a human, which gave him several divine characteristics, such as power, strength, and above all size. Gilgamesh was a man of truly large proportions and passed the average height of the population of Uruk. Gilgamesh was shown as one of the most powerful men on earth, and his kingdom was full of whims and designs dictated at random, as no one on the face of the earth could face or even refute the provisions of the king, son of gods. Before the entire population, Gilgamesh was a despicable and corrupt being, since his decisions went over the heads of the inhabitants of Uruk, abusing his power drastically, which caused a great dissatisfaction among the whole kingdom. Gilgamesh was so powerful and feared that even among some of the laws he laid down, he said that every woman in Uruk must sleep with the king before joining her husband. For many, this was a great outrage to the intimacy and dignity of women, and thus also of their future husbands. However, nothing could be done, for he was the supreme king and if anyone disagreed with his commands, he was immediately punished and condemned. In Uruk, the people were tired and frightened by the reign of Gilgamesh, and they pleaded with prayers and offerings to the goddess of creation Ninhursag, to remedy the situation and to cease the rule of Gilgamesh. The goddess Ninhursag, the lady of the mountain, as an act of mercy, would have listened and decided to help the unhappy population of Uruk. So Ninhursag created a mystical and wild being, taking some clay and giving it a humanoid form, with the features of a beast. Ninhursag assigned to that enigmatic creature the name of Enkidu, and also endowed him with great strength so that he could confront and above all defeat the great Gilgamesh, and released him on earth saying, Fight each other, so that Uruk may know peace. Enkidu came to earth as a wild man, of rustic and primitive aspect. He wore long and heavy animal skins to cover his body, and in front of the citizens of Uruk, he was a wild being. The lady of the mountain, Ninhursag, left Enkidu in the forest so that he alone could go to Gilgamesh's chamber. However, unfortunately, as he wandered through the forest, surrounded by extraordinary nature, the savage would have forgotten his task. Enkidu, engrossed in a terrible omission, remained tied to the freedom of the forest, and the days passed, and he could not remember what was the main purpose for which he was on earth. He ate and drank the same as the other animals of the forest and together with them he wandered through the wilderness and was even considered one of the wild animal kingdoms. Then Ninhursag saw everything that happened, very worried about Enkidu, because he was behaving like a real beast and decided to take control of the uncontrolled matter. However, she did not succeed. Enkidu was so disoriented and invaded by a wild feeling that it was not possible for him to come to his senses or even to follow the orders of his creator. Ninhursag knew that this represented a huge problem and above all a great delay in helping the citizens of Uruk who were under the yoke of Gilgamesh. One day, a hunter who was grazing his animals very close to the forest always led his beasts to a water source to drink, and there that day stood in front of him Enkidu surrounded by gazelles drinking water. The hunter was so frightened that he could not even move for several minutes. When he regained consciousness, he saw his face and realized that it was not a normal animal, but a man covered entirely with hair like a beast. The hunter did not flinch, but was stunned. Fear overcame the poor man who was walking with his animals, and when he regained consciousness, he returned home to meet his father and tell him all that he had witnessed. The hunter said to his father, My father, a man has come from the mountains. The weight of his strength is felt in the country and he has the vigor of a paladin of Anu. He travels incessantly through the country with his flocks. He always struts through the whole district, and at the watery places he plants his feet. I am so frightened that I dare not approach. He has filled up the ditches I had opened. He has destroyed the traps I had set. He has caused the beasts to escape from my hands, and he also prevents me from hunting on the plain. 
the father on hearing such a story told him that there was no being with so much vigor and much worse with more strength than Gilgamesh, for he is the only one sent by the gods to protect and direct Uruk. And he finished by saying that he should go to the throne of Gilgamesh and keep him informed of such an intriguing situation. So, the hunter went to the palace, and in front of King Gilgamesh, he told him about the beast he had seen in the forest, looking for an answer. So, the king told him to go in search of Shamat, a woman considered a sacred prostitute, from the temples of Uruk, to transform him from a wild beast to a civilized man. Gilgamesh told the noble hunter that Shamat should seduce Enkidu and that after that he should have sex for six days and seven nights in a row so that through sex Enkidu would be enlightened and civilized. Thus, at that moment Ninhursag delivered the power of Kuzba or the power of seduction to Shamat to go to Enkidu to comply with the request. Shamat, as Gilgamesh entrusted her through the hunter, seduced Enkidu lustfully, and they had relations for six days and seven nights. Only then the creature understands many things, and remembers what the goddess ordered in the beginning. Enkidu was not entirely convinced by Gilgamesh's idea, for the king had described the hideous creature as a fire-breathing being of death. However, the king was so insistent that Enkidu ended up accepting Gilgamesh's crazy idea. The king told his new friend that between the two of them they would be so powerful that they would be able to kill the forest beast with great ease. And not only that, but also that the forest would now be liberated so that men could enter without fear. Quickly, the king of Uruk ordered the manufacture of the best weapons for the historic confrontation. And these weapons were to be made in front of the brave men who would fight against Humbaba. On the day the two strongest men of Uruk set out on their journey, on the outskirts of the walled city, Gilgamesh knelt down and with prayers begged the god Shamash to help him in battle, and above all to bring him back alive to Uruk and so they set out. They knew it was a somewhat long journey, for it would take them some days to reach the cedar forest. During the journey, Gilgamesh had terrible nightmares and every night Enkidu was bewildered by so many moans of Gilgamesh, which made Enkidu panic and fear. But in the morning Gilgamesh encouraged him and convinced him to continue with this colossal journey. They continued for long days until in the distance they saw the huge cedars that warned that their destination was in sight. Thus, when Enkidu arrived, he showed a face of terror, for he feared the giant guardian that dwelt in the forest. On the other hand, Gilgamesh was quite convinced of victory, for with his great and powerful friends they were indestructible. Again, the king encourages and encourages Enkidu to continue, then Enkidu shows courage and anger and follows Gilgamesh into the forest, in search of the dreaded Humbaba. It did not take long and in surprise they were already in front of the terrible monster. Then a feeling of fear filled the being of Gilgamesh, who at first did not have a single drop of fear. Enkidu looks at Gilgamesh's disheveled face and returns the favor. This time it is he who encourages him, and hitting him with a shout reminds him of the mission they had. In seconds Gilgamesh was again in combat position and both launched into battle against the feared giant. The battle was bloody, the beast had a huge force that for a few moments seemed to win the battle, but the god Shamash witnessing the battle decided to help Gilgamesh, so he sent thirteen powerful winds with a single finger. Gilgamesh and Enkidu took advantage of the divine help of the god, and with the great cunning and agility of men, managed to knock down Hababa, and being already on the ground, the giant begs for his life. However, Enkidu was determined to kill him. The monster Humbaba with his last breath before dying, curses the men and is killed by Gilgamesh. Enkidu and Gilgamesh celebrated the victory amid tears and laughter, for by defeating the giant Humbaba, they left the cedar forest free of evil. Now they were convinced that the power they possessed was of divine origin, and their strength was so enormous that no being on earth could defeat them. As always, the gods kept the humans under constant observation, and in this case, they witnessed the battle of the men of Uruk against the giant guardian Humbaba. Thus, Ishtar fixed her gaze directly on Gilgamesh. Ishtar was so fascinated with the figure and strength of Gilgamesh that she immediately thought of proposing something to him that no other would refuse. Ishtar approaches the king of Uruk and proposes to be his lover. Ishtar, being a goddess of love and fertility, was well known for having multiple lovers and the love of this beautiful young goddess was considered very dangerous. 
For Gilgamesh, the proposal was a mere mockery, because he, for no reason would accept such a proposal, so with strong words he tells the goddess that he does not accept to be her lover, and that he did not want any relationship with her. The goddess Ishtar felt very offended to be rejected by a mortal, then curses Gilgamesh, and withdraws to her father Anu's chambers, god of heavens. Gilgamesh ignored the words said by the goddess and continued on his way. However, for the goddess the rejection caused her great pain, so much so that when she reached her father's palace she complained disconsolately, and begged Anu to punish Gilgamesh for the great fault he committed. Ishtar tells her father to create a celestial bull or bull of the heavens so that Gilgamesh feels what true fear is and thus can take revenge on the hero. He also tells him that if he does not do what the goddess asked, he will shatter the gates of the underworld, and that on earth the number of the dead will be greater than the number of the living. Anu was surprised by what his daughter said, and was very doubtful about that plan, but before the threat of the goddess decides to do it. Then Anu tells his daughter that he will do it, but that she should understand that, if he agreed, the earth would experience seven years of scarcity and drought. And he ends up asking the goddess if she had already gathered enough supplies for the people and the beasts during all that time of scarcity and famine. Ishtar answers him by saying, I have stored up grain for the people and there will be provision of fodder for the beasts, in case the land is barren for seven years. So, Anu sends to earth the terrible beast. At first this beast killed hundreds of men only with his breath and gradually instilled fear in the city of Uruk. The bull of heaven was so feared in the city that many begged the king to defeat the beast and save Uruk from destruction and famine. Enkidu listened to the pleas of the men of the town every day. They described the beast as a real evil demon. Then Enkidu decides to confront the animal together with Gilgamesh. Upon encountering the beast, Enkidu throws himself upon it and grabs it by the huge sharp horns, as if trying to subdue it. On the other hand, Gilgamesh with all his strength battled the animal from below with great swords. Soon the bull was foaming at the mouth and fell with a great roar to the ground. Enkidu seeing that fall the great celestial bull said to Gilgamesh, Friend, we have triumphed. So, both tore out the heart of the terrible beast, and in gratitude they offered it to the god Shamash. All the people were grateful for the great deed of the heroes and were praised for the great achievement that saved all of Uruk. On the other hand, Ishtar was full of anger, for her plan had failed, and not only that, but she felt insulted by killing the beast that she had commanded through her father. The goddess approached the wall of Uruk to see what was happening, and when Enkidu saw her, he quickly cut the parts of the bull and threw them on the goddess, and told her that if she dared to enter Uruk he would do the same to her as he had done to the bull. That same night Gilgamesh offers a feast in his palace in the name of the victory achieved. All the people attended the great event that celebrated the two great heroes that the city of Uruk had. Enkidu already in his dwelling while resting, had an intriguing dream, and above all caused him much fear, because in the dream he saw the decision of his death. Already in the morning, Enkidu says to Gilgamesh, Listen to the dream I had tonight. Anu, Enlil, Ea, and Shamash, god of the sky, were gathered in council. And Anu said to Ea, Because they have slain the celestial bull and Humbaba who lived on the cedar mountain, they must be put to death. But Enlil answered, Enkidu must die, and Gilgamesh must not die. Gilgamesh answers him with words of encouragement, and goes with concern to the temple of Shamash to pray for his great friend. Ishtar was very angry and turns again to her father, Anu, to punish the men for killing the divine beasts. Anu and the other gods decided what would be the punishment for offending the divine power, because Enkidu and Gilgamesh had killed the bull of the heavens and the giant Humbaba and such acts were unforgivable. Amidst the wrath of the gods, they decided to punish Enkidu with death. However, Shamash objected, but the power of Anu was much greater than that possessed by Shamash, and they decided to put Enkidu to death. Enkidu was very intrigued by the dream he had had. However, he continued with his normal life in the palace of Uruk with his good friend Gilgamesh. Unfortunately, as the days passed Enkidu became sicker and sicker, then Enkidu reproached and regretted that he had come to Uruk, that he had become civilized, for he was destined to die. For a long time, 
Gilgamesh went without fail to the temple of Shamash to plead for Enkidu's health, without success, for every moment that passed Enkidu worsened drastically. Until one day his breath ran out, he had died. Gilgamesh touched the body of his friend, and his heart stopped beating, and his breathing was nil. Understanding that Enkidu had departed, Gilgamesh broke down in tears and despair embraced Enkidu's corpse tightly, and named each of their deeds together. Gilgamesh was disconsolate, for he had been left alone, and his companion of adventures was condemned to death. Then to Gilgamesh's mind came a fear of death, for he did not want to die like Enkidu. The king of Uruk was afraid of death, and he became so desperate that next to the inert body of Enkidu he made a hard decision. Gilgamesh told all his royal court and other inhabitants that he would go in search of eternal life because he did not want to have the same end as his beloved friend. He now sought immortality. Gilgamesh remembered that on earth there were only two humans who achieved immortality given by the gods themselves. So he decided to go in search of them to ask for help and to know what he should do to receive this blessing. Utnapishtim and his wife were the only human beings who received immortality. After surviving the great flood that intended to end humanity, knowing this event Gilgamesh decides to undertake a journey to the rooms of the spouses. The king of Uruk prepared himself for a long journey to find Anapishtim and together with him, eternal life. The days passed, and the journey seemed to get longer and longer, until he reached the two mountains from where the sun rises and at the entrance of these mountains Gilgamesh fixed his gaze on some strange beings that were heading towards him. Gilgamesh was at first intimidated and thought it would be the end of him. Gilgamesh's eyesight cleared and he could see that they were the famous scorpion men guardians of the mountains. Gilgamesh was numb with fear, for it was well known that these creatures were fatal. Their heads brushed the base of the heavens, and their chests touched the hells. The scorpion men, guardians of the gates of the sun, aroused great terror, and above all who behold them die. Gilgamesh did not let fear invade him, and so he decided to pay homage and bow before the scorpion man who was at the door of the mountain. So from afar the scorpion man looked at him and said to his wife, Look at that man of a beautiful figure, denotes a great strength. The wife immediately replied, That man has two of his three parts of God and the other of man. Now standing face to face with Gilgamesh, the scorpion man asked him, From far away you have come to me. Why have you crossed stormy seas on your journey to me? What purpose has brought you here? Then Gilgamesh respectfully answers, I have come because of Anapishtim, my ancestor, who knew how to reach the council of the gods and obtain eternal life. I want to question him about death and life. Then the scorpion man is surprised by Gilgamesh's answer and not only that but also by how far the hero had come. So he tells him that no mortal has ever been able to reach that point. No one has ever traveled the path that goes twelve leagues into the mountain. He also tells him that darkness reigns in that place and that no light shines, either at sunrise nor at sunset. Gilgamesh was determined to go through all the vicissitudes that the road had in store for him and says, In pain or sorrow, suffering heat or cold, sighing or groaning, I will go on. Now, open the mountain gate. Then the scorpion man told him that he would open the gates for him, for he is a great hero, for he has come unharmed to the gates of the mountain where the sun rises and where the sun dies. So, Gilgamesh thanked the scorpion men, guardians of Mashu, and went down the little path. As he went on, the darkness grew thicker and thicker until he reached a point where he could see absolutely nothing ahead or behind him in any direction. Despite Gilgamesh's great fear, he advanced without stopping. He knew that he must not falter. He had to move forward and continue with his objective. For many days, he did not see a single ray of light, and he thought that the darkness was getting thicker and thicker. At about nine leagues, he felt a strong wind blowing from the north. At eleven leagues, however, he saw a small light from Alba. He continued without rest, and at twelve leagues Gilgamesh saw the sunlight at last. Gilgamesh was really happy, for at last his sight was clear, and the first thing he saw was a very bright gigantic tree. He went to it with rejoicing, and as he approached such a magnificent tree, he saw that its fruits were of the most beautiful shining rubies. He rested in the place and a sharp voice addressed Gilgamesh. It came from the god Shamash, 
who asked him why he wandered from place to place without meaning and ended by telling him that the life he seeks will never be found. Gilgamesh answered God by saying, Having sought my way in the plain, in the heart of the starless earth, where my march seemed to last for years, I want my eyes to behold the sun and to be flooded by luminous streams. Gilgamesh continued on his way, and suddenly he noticed a woman who looked at him in terror, for his clothes and appearance were so nauseating that the woman was frightened, and immediately entered her tavern, blocking the door so that the unknown man would not enter. Gilgamesh, seeing what the tavern keeper did, bowed his head and with the little strength he had left told her not to be afraid, that he would not do anything to her. So, the woman comes out and tells Gilgamesh what is the reason for such exhaustion and little strength that he denoted, and above all what was the purpose of wandering in the bush alone. Gilgamesh sadly tells everything he lived in Uruk with Enkidu, and also tells him that he is in search of Utnapishtim because he will help him to achieve immortality. Siduri the tavern keeper tells him not to wander through life without purpose, since the gods at creation had created man and decreed that they were destined to die. She also tells him that he should enjoy everything that life gives him and also the little things that life gives him. However, Siduri's words were in vain, for Gilgamesh turned a deaf ear and decided to continue his journey to Utnapishtim. Then Gilgamesh asked Siduri to show him the way he should take to Utnapishtim's quarters. The tavern keeper tells him that it is a journey full of vicissitudes and that he had to pass the most terrifying and deadly waters of the world and that to cross it he had to cross with the great Urshanabi, a divine boatman who knew the waters and the island where Anapishtim lived with his wife. Siduri tried to stop Gilgamesh since no one had ever crossed the waters of death. However, Gilgamesh told him to take him to Urshanabi to start his journey. He arrives at Urshanabi's boat and Gilgamesh tells him all his story and the purpose of the journey he had. Then Urshanabi agreed to help him, and so they set off for the island, out to sea, passing through the waters of death. Urshanabi told Gilgamesh that his hands must not touch the waters, and so after a while the boatmen looked away from the island, announcing that they had reached Utnapishtim. On the other hand, from the shore of the island, Utnapishtim watched carefully, for Urshanabi always traveled alone and no one else had come so far, much less a mortal. They arrived and quickly Gilgamesh makes a small bow to Utnapishtim and tells him his story amidst tears and laughter. Utnapishtim receives him in his house, which was a huge ship product of the great flood he survived. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that for him to understand why the gods gave him the gift of immortality, and how all this helped him to become part of the council of the gods, he had to know and understand all the history that happened with the great flood that wiped out almost all of humanity. Utnapishtim tells him that he will reveal the great hidden secret, and so he begins to tell him the whole story. Utnapishtim begins by saying that many years ago the city of Surapak, a city that stretched along the banks of the Euphrates, was an ancient city, like their gods, when they decided to unleash the flood. When they decided that this event should take place, they were there, Anu, the father of the gods, the brave Enlil, his counselor, Ninurta, Inuj, and Ninijikuye. Then Ye told Utnapishtim in the name of all the gods, to tear down his hut and abandon all wealth for something very great would be about to happen. So also, Ye told him to build a great ship, with great dimensions of equal height and length, and that it should also have a strong roof. The god also charged Anapishtim that within it should fit all living beasts, and so also as many seeds as he could, for there would be a new beginning of mankind. The god told Anapishtim that Enlil was the protagonist and author of the great flood that was to be unleashed, and that there was no divine power to stop it. Then Utnapishtim had understood the magnitude of what was coming, and full of fear he said to Ye, It will be an honor for me to execute what you have commanded, but what shall I say to the city, to the people, to the elders? Then Ye answered him, saying, Thou shalt tell them this, I have learned that Enlil is my enemy, and so I cannot live in our city nor set foot in the territory of Enlil. Therefore, I will go to the deep waters to live with my lord Ye. So Utnapishtim quickly began the building, he gave notice to all his family, and before long they had a great part of the huge vessel advanced, and so on the fifth day, he erected the frame, the bottom of which was an acre, and each of its sides was ten dozen cubits high and ten dozen cubits each side of the deck. 
And so, at the end of the seventh day the ship was finished, and he began to gather day after day the beasts that he would put on the ship, much wine, plants, seeds, meat, and other provisions as the god Ye had told him. With everything ready, Anapishtim the only thing he was waiting for was the sign of the gods when they would unleash the great flood. So, the god Shamash came to Anapishtim and told him the time when the great storm would arrive, and told him that as soon as the night god appeared and the first drops of rain fell, he should get into the boat and close all the doors very well. Anapishtim waited for the exact moment, and as soon as he saw a great black cloud approaching, he knew it was time to go up, and so he tells Puzra Murray, the boatman, to take command and close all the doors very tightly. For six days and six nights, the flood wind blew, and the southern storm swept over the land. On the seventh day, the storm began to subside, little by little. The sea calmed, the storm abetted, and the flood ceased. Then Anapishtim peered through a small hatch to see if the great storm had indeed subsided. As he peered through the hole, what his eyes saw was a faint light penetrating the hatch, and further on he saw water everywhere, and mankind was now mud. Utnapishtim saw that in each of the fourteen regions a mountain emerged, and the great ship he built stopped on Mount Nazir, without letting it move. Then Utnapishtim released a dove, which quickly took flight, but immediately returned, for it could not find a place to alight. Then he sent out a swallow, and like the dove, it instantly returned. Later, on the other hand, he sent a raven, and this was different, for it did not return, but flew on until it disappeared. Utnapishtim waited, but the raven did not return, so he decided it was time for everyone to leave. He took out absolutely everything and when he finished, he offered a sacrifice on the top of the mountain next to seven bonfires. On the other hand, Enlil had complained to the other gods for helping Utnapishtim, since every living being had to die. However, the gods made Enlil see reason, and Enlil, because of Utnapishtim's perseverance, went to look for him to compensate him. So, Enlil enters Utnapishtim's ship and calls his wife, and there he makes them kneel and says to them, Until now, Utnapishtim, you have only been human, but from this moment, you and your wife, you will be like gods. He took their hands, and then he put his hand on the forehead of each one and gave them immortality. Utnapishtim told Gilgamesh that this was how things had happened and that thanks to the gods and the huge sacrifice he made at the great flood he was blessed. Then Gilgamesh told him that he wanted the same, but to help him achieve immortality by entering into an assembly with the gods. Utnapishtim told him that he must first pass an ordeal for him to agree to help him. Gilgamesh tells him that he will do his best to obtain eternal life. Then Utnapishtim tells him that he must stay awake for six days and seven nights, and that, if he succeeds in doing so, he will gather the gods so that he will obtain immortality. Gilgamesh accepts. However, as soon as he settles down to rest a deep sleep envelopes him, and he faints instantly. Utnapishtim says to his wife, Look at the strong man who desires immortality. Sleep, like a furious wind, has enveloped him. So, the wife tells him to wake the poor boy and that she will prepare food for his return. Utnapishtim approaches Gilgamesh and wakes him by shaking him. Then the king of Uruk in his sleep wakes up very frightened, for he had failed in the ordeal. Utnapishtim told him that he could not help him, and with an angry voice told him to return with Urshanabi on the way to Uruk so that he would return safe and sound. Gilgamesh was very sorry for what had happened and begged Utnapishtim disconsolately to help him. However, he was unwilling to help him, as he believed he was not worthy. On the other hand, Utnapishtim's wife tells him to help the wretched Gilgamesh, for he had traveled so far, had been victorious in all his journey, and it would be right to help him. Then Utnapishtim calls Gilgamesh, who was already steps away from boarding the boat, and tells him that he will help him just because he is a brave man but stresses to him that what he will reveal to him will not give him immortality, but he will receive more life and youth. Gilgamesh gratefully and flatteringly thanks him infinitely for that act of the immortal. Utnapishtim and his wife tell him that at the bottom of the sea, there is a plant that will endow him with life above life, and will make him rejuvenate once he eats it, leaving his old skin behind and exchanging it for a new and young one. Gilgamesh stripped off his clothes and dived just as the husband and wife said, tying a large rock on his leg. When he reached the bottom, 
he saw a plant very similar to that of a thorn lily. He took it and came out of the water very happy and grateful. At last, Gilgamesh had gotten one step closer to immortality and was grateful. At that moment he went to the boat and told their shinabi to take him to Uruk, and being there they would eat of the plant and give the magical plant to all the people. They set out again on the journey to Uruk and on the way Gilgamesh saw a beautiful spring of crystal clear water and told their shinabi to go there to rest and bathe. They do so, and Gilgamesh undresses and enters the fountain, leaving his clothes and the magical plant at the edge of the fountain. However, Gilgamesh did not count on the fact that the plant emanated too strong a smell that attracted the attention of a stealthy snake, which discreetly approached the plant. Gilgamesh did not notice the lurking beast, and when he turned to look at the magical plant for which he had fought so hard, the snake had already devoured the entire plant without leaving a single leaf. Gilgamesh cried over death, because he did not believe what was happening, the plant for which he went through the worst vicissitudes now no longer existed, the snake had swallowed it, and in front of Gilgamesh's eyes, the snake left its old skin behind, and continued on its way with a beautiful new and young skin. Gilgamesh entered again in uncontrollable weeping, pitifully nothing could be done, his journey had been unsuccessful, for in the end, he did not get what he had dreamed of one day. Bitterly, Gilgamesh returned to Uruk, and already in the city in the distance he saw the great walls he had built and told their shinabi, who accompanied him, to admire the great work he had done in his city. And so, he returned empty-handed, but with many new experiences and learnings that would make him wiser.